wanted to save the world. I wanted to look in the eyes of hurting people and bring them hope. Not here in the United States, but abroad, overseas, in third world countries where the real problems were, where the real hurt was. I got to grow up in a home where we had a steady flow of international humanitarian workers passing through my house. And as a child, I got to sit and listen to their stories, wild stories of feeling the breath of a panther on the back of their neck while sitting around a campfire or crossing a piranha-infested river all while working with indigenous people from all over the globe. Of course, this was all done in beautiful and exotic settings, and that was for me. That's what I wanted. So in my college age years, I traveled the world some. I was looking for the right climate, the right culture, the right setting that I would return to one day in my world-saving adventures. After I graduated as a physician assistant, I thought I'd stick around in the United States for a while, find a job that would prepare me for the humanitarian scene abroad, maybe with working with under, underserved um, international people locally, get some additional training, and then in a couple years, set off on my life's journey, my life's mission overseas. I didn't find the exact job I was looking for, but I got pretty close. The local nonprofit called Fourth Street Clinic. They provide primary um, health care to homeless people here in the Salt Lake area. Not long after I was working there, I, I noticed there was a disparity. Not all homeless people were coming into the clinic to get care. I would notice, I would drive around you know, after work on the weekends and see that there were people that rarely, if ever, came to our clinic. And that's when the realization struck me. The same desperate need I was looking to meet in other countries was right in front of my face, in my own city. I could help here. This was, I would find out, to be my world. People who don't access services are also some of the same people with the greatest needs. So we decided to take health care to them in the form of street medicine, bringing health care to them in their reality, right where they are. We focus on service-resistant individuals. They may have physical problems, mental illness, substance use disorders. Many have all three. It's not uncommon for them to have an atrocious abuse history from friends, neighbors, family, people they should be able to trust, like Sarah. Sarah is one such young lady. She, uh, her abuse started as a child and continued through her whole life up until her current time. She has three kids of her own that have been adopted out. She lives with these traumas, but she doesn't want to. So she covers them up, makes them disappear by using drugs. She pays for those drugs any way that she can, primarily by walking the streets and getting in strangers' cars or portable bathrooms and exchanging sex for money or, or drugs themselves. Her physical dependency on heroin is such that a break from this activity is not something that she's willing to do to get the help she needs. Partly because the help she needs includes sobriety. And you see, sobriety means remembering all those traumas from the past and the present. We've seen Sarah in the street, sidewalks, in parks, in hospitals, in jail. And that's where we go, literally anywhere homeless people are. We try to connect them with the services that they so desperately need. This reminds me of Bill. Bill's from the Avenues. Um, he left home in his early teens to get away from the alcohol and drugs that were there. He only moved a couple lots down and lived in a tent. Unfortunately, the cycle continued and, and he too started using drugs and alcohol. He didn't graduate high school. He was in and out of jail and prison. And his last time out of prison is whenever I, I met him at the clinic. He came in, and we started seeing him 
regularly. And not long after, he, he stopped coming. One day, a while later, and after we had started doing street medicine, an outreach worker from another agency said, hey, there's this guy down in Sugar House. He's in a bus stop on the corner. He's got something that looks pretty bad with his leg. Maybe you could check him out. So we go, I go down to that corner. I walk into the bus stop, and there's a homeless-looking man, sullen and sunken, and he could see something was seeping through his, his pants down by his ankle. I introduced myself, and he said, I know who you are. You don't recognize me, do you? I'm Bill. I'm back on heroin, and I'm not doing very well. So we were able to reconnect with, with Bill, start taking care of his wounds. It would often require daily visits. We were able to um, get other outreach workers from other agencies to bring services to him, such as housing and other essentials of staying alive. We were able to take him to other facilities to work with his substance use disorder and, and start down that path. One day his failing health caught up with him and he ended up in the hospital. He was able, and he got admitted, and he was able to, um, to get stable on his health and with his addiction through an amazing team of social workers and healthcare providers. At the end, we were able to discharge him from the hospital to temporary housing and to permanent supportive housing. And that, that's just one small example of how vital community collaboration is. This isn't the norm everywhere. Salt Lake City is kind of unique in this. We've been recognized nationally and internationally for our community and how we collaborate. There are many organizations that work together as one organism to provide this care. Services like housing, substance abuse, detoxification, and treatment, clinics for health, mental illness, substance abuse, emergency shelter and services, and, and a lot more. If one of those agencies tried to do this all on their own, it would be very difficult to meet that complex need. But together, we provide excellent care. It's, it's a machine. It's a complex system from the state level to the local nonprofit. But it's the people that make the difference. It's people helping people. Human beings working with other human beings to build trust, find the root problem of their issue, and develop specialized individual plans for that person. It's people respecting people, acknowledging that we're equals, neither of us better or worse than the other. We can approach people with respect for themselves, for their space, for their belongings, we can offer a smile, we can look them in their eyes, offer a handshake, we can say hi as we walk by. If they don't want to talk, it's okay, then we don't have to talk. Their reaction to our kindness is not our responsibility. In my own journey in working with homeless people, I've come to realize it is not about me. I cannot save the world. I cannot save them. And I may one day go to that beautiful and exotic place somewhere, and that's okay. But it's not about me saving anyone anymore. It's about us, how we, as a community of people, can come together as individuals and bring hope to others. Bill used to tell me, he was always so thankful for the help that he got. And he used to tell me that, that when he was on the street corner flying his sign, that's what they call panhandling, flying a sign, that the thing that gave him the most encouragement when he was standing there and looking in cars were smiles. And they were often the smiles from children. Lisa. Lisa was from a middle-class family here in the Salt Lake area. She got into drugs in her teens, was able to go to rehab, got clean and sober. 
She actually worked for a rehab for a number of years afterwards. She relapsed and ended up on the streets and was a sex worker on the streets, and that's when we met her. And we worked with her for a while, and then she ended up in jail. But she got clean and sober. And when she, when she got out of jail, she stayed clean and sober. She found a friend that was able to let her sleep on the couch, and she spent her, her daytime hours looking for a job. And one, one night, after spending all day looking for work, she was heading back home and got a ride with a stranger, and she was taken and brutally beaten and violently raped. And she told me later that while, while she was being raped, she remembered us telling her that she was worth so much. She did not deserve to be treated that way. Though she'd been raped many times before, she just assumed it was part of her life. Not until this time had she ever reported a rape. And, now she, and then she was able to get the help that she needed. A couple weeks ago, I was in the jail seeing Sarah. And we finished seeing her, and we started to walk away. And she stopped me. I turned around, and she was kind of hanging on her jail cell door, and there's a window, and I could see her big, beautiful smile with missing and, and rotten teeth and these big blue eyes and frizzy, messy blonde hair. And what she said next took my breath away. She said, Joel, I am so glad I'm worth seeing. Lisa and Sarah are realizing their value and their worth. They're finding their place in this world, and they're using their voice. I don't, I don't know the, right, the quick answer to ending poverty or homelessness or abuse. I can't give you the right answer to tell the panhandler you drive past or walk by. But what I do know is that dignity can be restored through hope often in the simplest ways. And this is something we can do as a community. You can smile at somebody. You can offer a handshake. You can look somebody in the eye. Acknowledge they exist. I invite you to see homeless people. Thank you.